Howdy folks, I'm Mark Rutten. Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. I thought today we would take a look at an old project of mine. This was the third boat I ever built and I built it back in, I want to say 1995 maybe. It's glued lap straight plywood built using the Tom Hill method. And that means we're using a mold with rib bands attached to it that mimic the plank lines. And you use those rib bands both to support the light plywood planking as you're building it, and they define the, the boundaries of your planks. That is, they, they'll, you can trace your planks directly from them, showing you the top and bottom edges of your planks. Uh, when I was just getting started, I thought this was a great way to go, and I still do. I still think, especially for a beginner, that the glued lap strike method is a really great way to get into wooden boat building better than even strip building, I believe. And that's because the materials are very easy to source. That is, marine plywood is readily available. Uh, and it requires very little milling to get started. We don't need to worry about stuffing piles of cedar through a thickness planer and through table saws and using routers to put molding details on the edges of it. We're simply starting with sheet goods. We have to learn a little bit of scarfing, which is not difficult to do. And from there on in, it is a very straightforward process for the most part. Now that said, I made a bunch of different little mistakes on this project. And I thought it might be interesting to kind of look at where I kind of screwed up, or maybe we'll look at where I did things in ignorance. I won't say screw ups because the boat's completed. You know, it's been the better part of 30 years since I built this thing. It's still functioning. I still own it. So these canoes are intended to be used with a double paddle. They call them double paddle canoes. So they're essentially a solo canoe. You sit in them like a kayak. If you're not interested in putting on spray skirts and wetsuits and things like that, they're actually a great way to get out on the water. Uh, my only criticism about them is that they tend to be a little bit wet to paddle. That is, you get drips coming down off of the paddle and into your lap, which I don't really like. Now, I don't mind that if it's a hot summer day and I'm in shorts and that sort of thing, but if it's inclement weather, I don't like that. And I will tend to sort of switch over to a single bladed paddle, which is gonna be drier to use. They're a little difficult to use with a single bladed paddle, but not impossible. You just have to have your J-stroke down well. And if you do, they're really a great boat. So let's take a closer look at this boat. We'll look at some of the details and talk about what I did well and what I didn't do so well. Let's just start with the finishing, actually. Why not we work our way backwards? This is a varnished hull. However, I didn't want to accentuate the grain of the plywood because I don't find marine plywood to have a particularly pleasing grain, but I did want color on it. So to that end, I didn't want to stain it. What I did do is I used what's called a glaze. That is, I varnished the hull, a couple of coats, and then I started putting color into my varnish. I used universal pigments, colored the varnish to a tone that I thought would be good, and then put on multiple layers of that tinted varnish. So they're, each layer is translucent. Now the downside to that is you have to be very careful about brush streaks. And even in this, you can see how it's a little bit varied because of the brush streaks that you get when you do this, especially if you overbrush. Another thing that I learned the hard way is if you put too much pigment into it, it sometimes will get a bit muddy looking. So in some light, this is a very almost like purple heart colored uh, hull, but then another light, you can see it up here possibly, the way the light hits it up here, it looks kind of like a muddy brown. And it's funny how that it changes depending on how the light hits it. So in hindsight, I think I should have just tried staining this plywood rather than putting the glazes on there. I probably could have tried applying a second coat of stain if the first one didn't do the job I wanted to. Now, if you wanted to try doing this yourself, the thing to keep in mind is that those stains are probably not going to stick to epoxied surfaces very well. So if you have, uh, say, scarf joints and fillets and things like that that have got epoxy on them, you might want to think about tinting that epoxy down ahead of time to match your eventual stain color. And in many cases, that just means using an appropriate colored filler in the epoxy in order to bring it down closer to the color you want. Generally, you want it to be probably a bit darker than the rest of the material that you're working with. Now on the bottom, I decided to just use 
black paint. And I did that on the first couple of planks, actually the garbards and the next two planks up. I did that so that I could have an easy job of doing touch-ups. So as I'm using the boat and it's getting scraped up on the bottom, I can just grab any old black paint and give it a coat. In fact, I think I just used like Tremclad or something very sort of hardware store-esque at the time. I still think that was a good idea and I used the plank laps themselves as the defining line for that painted bottom as opposed to doing a proper water line. And so that means that this painted bottom does not follow the surface of the water. When you get up here, it's sort of a little bit pokes up when you're, when you're paddling. Most of it is below the water while, you're, while it's in use because the water line comes up a bit higher. And I think that works out pretty good actually. And when it comes to recoating, it's easier to just follow a plank line than it is to try and tape off a water line. Especially on lap straight planking, where taping off a level water line is actually quite difficult. Now on the inside, I've just used plain untinted varnish. And I think I used a polyurethane on this, I believe. I was using Sickens products at the time. And uh, they've held up very, very well. However, there is some degradation that's happening in here. Now I've been particularly good about trying to stay on top of revarnishing this over the years. How, but in the last few years, I've gotten lazy about it because I haven't really used the boat much. Now the number one rule about varnish is you re-varnish before it looks like it needs re-varnishing. That means if it starts getting a little bit dull, that's the time to re-varnish. Don't wait until that varnish is breaking down and peeling off. You've already lost the game at that point. It's always been stored under cover, outside, on racks, well elevated off the ground, with a loose tarp over top. It's on the shady side of the house. And it never really gets direct sun, except for a few moments in the morning when the sun is coming up at certain times of the year, and a few moments in the evening as the sun is coming down, and a little bit of raking light hits this. Now, the funny thing is, the side of the boat that is on the more exposed side, that is the outboard side, has got more varnish degradation happening than on the other side. And what I find odd about this is that it's never exposed to UV light exactly. It's breaking down and you can see it's like the wood grain is breaking through the varnish. It's like wood movement that has been causing this. This degradation doesn't show on the outside, the side that gets light hitting it. It only shows on the inside that's getting virtually no light hitting it. So I'm really at a bit of a loss. It's primarily all on the planks that have got black paint. Now on the side that's against the house, that's the shadier side, it's not showing any of that, uh, except for right near the ends where some of that raking light hits it. So it must be the way the black planking heats up from that sunlight hitting it, even briefly, and just causing that, that plywood to want to move just a little tiny bit. And um, I find that so curious because the, the top side planking doesn't show that really at all. It has been really good about being rot free all these years. There's a few spots where I probably shouldn't have done what I did. One of those spots is here where I've got the stem band running the, around the outside and then passing through this gunnel construction here. So the gunnels sandwich over this stem band. Now the reason that's bad is just because it's very hard to seal where metal and wood come together that water tends to work its way in. It hasn't really gotten rotty or anything like that, but it's clearly not the best idea. Perhaps you can see right here how the stem bands overhang the planking a little bit. I certainly didn't get the planking all in the same orientation as neatly as I could have. And I probably didn't bring back the face of that planking enough to allow this stem band to land on there properly. If I were to do this again, I would have taken this back much further and I would have put a hardwood cut water on the outside before the stem band. Having this planking, these plank laps come right to the stem band is not something that I think is a good idea. However, the book I was following specifically recommended doing this as a simplicity, but I don't think it's a good one. Now, one thing I did do, which I think was smart, was through the stem band here, I drilled a hole through the deck so that there's a little bit of drainage that can happen uh, for any water that sits up underneath the decks while it's in storage. So it doesn't look very pretty, but at least it's there. 
when I lined out this planking, I erroneously brought the garbards together here still on the keel. What I should have done is brought those garbards all the way through to here. I was ignorant about the best way to line out a boat or what you should be doing when you're lining out a boat in terms of shaping the planks, sizing the planks. Uh, the idea that planks needed to taper from their widest, the midships down to something narrower at the ends was not necessarily a, a clear concept to me. And for some reason, this felt like the thing to do, but I was wrong. As a result, the next planks, which are going where the garbage should go, run out to here. And all the subsequent planks now have to flare out towards the ends of the boat in order to make up that space. The garbage are missing from the ends. So we've basically making up about three inches over the course of these other two, four or five planks. Well, four planks really, because one of them is just doing the garbage job. So that was kind of a, a bonehead maneuver on my part, but it's, I, it's something that I didn't even really conceive of until late, years later when I was learning properly about boat building and looking back at my work and saying, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. Now, another thing that I did that wasn't so smart was I don't think I had any clear concept of how to lay out molds. When I built this, I took the design for a smaller boat, a 12 foot boat, that I had already built. That was my second boat that I built. I wanted to make it longer, stretch it out to 15 feet. And I think I sat down and I kind of fudged out how much further apart I needed to spread my molds to try and get it to 15 feet. But what I didn't do was use like a good stiff batten to make sure those were all in alignment. Now it was a battened mold. So that pretty much took care of lining up all those molds. And maybe I fudged them a little bit uh, after I started putting battens on, I don't remember because it was a long time ago. But what I got wrong was towards the ends here, I don't think I tapered off my stem properly. And as a result, I've got this planking that comes in here. It comes together, but then it swells out ever so slightly and then comes together again at the stem. So I think it was a combination of not beveling my stem off properly and possibly having too much of a distance from my stem to my next mold. Basically the boat should have stopped, you know, six or eight inches sooner relative to the way the molds were spaced. And I didn't have enough uh, sense about that to make sure that I didn't squish these in as I was gluing these up. I probably should have found a way to let them spring out a little bit. Now structurally, it's not a big deal. It's really just an aesthetic issue, but um, it's one that I couldn't see before. Now, one of the things that I did was laminate up the decks. I think I was just working with smaller pieces of stock that I had on hand. It's something I don't really like doing nowadays. I like to keep things simple. I would have oriented the grain differently than I did. These are just running straight fore and aft, but I think I was probably making, trying to make good use of what materials I had on hand. So the decks are mostly white cedar with a little bit of cherry sandwiched in there. And there's a lot of lines going through there because of these laminations. And at the time, I thought that was pretty cool stuff. I don't think it's cool stuff anymore. It's not to my taste. I've got these little combings, which I still think were kind of a, a nice detail. For some reason, I made them up in two pieces. I don't quite know why I did that. But uh, I think what I've done here is I've had got one that's laminated to the inside. And then the other one la just laps down on top of the deck. So it cleans up this deck joint nicely. I don't have to worry about it being so clean. Then they're glued together right in place. Another thing I did was create this little bird's mouth scarf up here. While I was aware of scarfing, I have, had never heard of a bird's mouth scarf exactly. So this was something I just kind of dreamed up. I didn't have material long enough for the full length of the boat uh, for the out whales. These are ash. So I added a little bit of cherry onto the end. And I used this bird's mouth scarf, which is bolt structural and decorative. Now that's something that I've gone on to use many, many times since then, because what I've learned is that you can create a structural joint using a bird's mouth scarf that's half as long as if you're to do a flat scarf. That is, you're using the same ratio, but it basically takes a turn. Throw, you throw it in reverse halfway through the joint. You still get the same strength, but you get it in half the length and it can look decorative. And so I think that's sort of a nice detail here uh, visually 
and it's something I use on canoe restoration where I will fix ribs using a bird's mouth scarf because I find that even though the scarf is not invisible, at least the scarf you do see looks more presentable than uh, a flat scarf that tends to just have a bit of a large, not particularly definite line to it. So one of the other little details I think I would do differently now is I would put a much broader molding onto this rub rail here. These are just very small roundovers, quarter inch at best, not even really. And so I would definitely put a heavier roundover, maybe even make this a full half round or, or some other ovoid shape. Uh, these are just a bit sharp, and as a result, you get a lot more wear and tear on on the hard spots along here on the edges. So the varnish is breaking down there, and ash is particularly bad for turning black once water gets into it. So there's no cleaning this up except for taking it right down to the wood and sanding it until you get rid of that color, unfortunately. You can see this sort of classic style willow leaf double paddle that I built. That's just white pine. It's not the lightest paddle in the world, but it's not the heaviest either. It works pretty good. And you can see how I'm using the locked gunnel to keep it uh, positioned in the boat with just some bits of webbing here. So that works fairly well. Then we have this exposed keelson in here. That's white cedar again. If I were to do this over, I would probably round over these edges because they're a bit sharp and exposed. Things like that. When if you take a if you're kneeling in the boat or whatnot, that can get a bit sore. So I would definitely soften those up. Now I do feel like I did a nice job on these thwarts. These are just white cedar. I left them a little bit chunky in order to give them the strength they would need, but they've got sort of a nice triangular configuration. And this one back here, which is supposed to serve as backrest as well as a thwart, is asymmetrical. So it tapers off this way. It's kind of plumb this way. Now I do use this webbing seat here, or as a or backrest at the very least. And that just adds quite a bit to the comfort. But sometimes if I got a longer PFD, I can just rest against that thwart there and that, that'll do the job fine. And down here we have this adjustable foot brace. That works okay, but it's a bit chunky, I think. And we've got this slat seat. These were done in cherry, and all the fasteners are not varnished over. So in theory, you should be able to just pop these slats out so you can do proper maintenance on this. You can see here, see all the black, that's from water penetration coming through the varnish. Now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to sand this varnish down and use a few coats of very thin varnish to try and get back down under those cracks. I don't want to strip this down to bare wood. Uh, that would be the best way to fix this, but I really don't have the interest or energy to do that. So we'll just do maintenance coats on it. The rest of it is just fine. It's just been recoded. I don't know how many times. There's got to be at least a dozen coats of varnish on here by now. 15 maybe. I don't remember. You'll notice a few fasteners through the gunwale construction here. And that's because I had an accident with the boat. I was carrying it. I had a piece of webbing, like a webbing belt, wrapped through here that was coming up over one shoulder. And I think I took a spill or something like that, and the whole boat got jarred. There was no fastenings in these gunnels before, and this in whale just popped right off. There was no glue failure. It was all wood grain failure throughout. But, you know, from about here through to about there, it all broke away. And so I had to sort of go to a local hardware store and get what I could to fix it. I think I got some polyester resin and a handful of brass screws. I've never been able to get these ones out now that they're in. A couple other ones I was able to get out. And I've added some rivets to make sure that doesn't happen again. And ever since then, I've come to not be 100% confident in just glue joints on higher stress things like that. So I will always put some mechanical fasteners in those. So one other little detail that I'm not a big fan of, it's this blocked 
gunnels. And I know these are very common. I know these are very traditional and they're basically a carryover from when we had ribs running through a boat and those ribs were sandwiched between gunnels. So structurally, they were just a simple way to create a boat and tie the ribs to the gunnels themselves. They would leave spaces in between, of course. Now, when we mimic it like this, we do add structure to it. So we get a wider, stiffer gunnel with less weight. However, the effort required to put this blocking in is not massive, but it is something. But more importantly, it's when you go to finishing when you start finishing these boats, these little blocked gunnels are just a massive time killer. You gotta worry about cleaning up all the glue in each one of them as you make them. And then as you start varnishing, every time you varnish your gunnels, varnish is wanting to come and drip down through onto your inside. Or if you're varnishing the inside, you're always worrying about trying to get up into this little hole here. And on the other side too, trying to, trying to get proper coats in there is really, really tough. It does give you some spots that you can lash things to, that's great, but you could do that in other ways. Or maybe you could just reduce the number of spaces and just give yourself a few blocking spots that you can lash things to, or even add a little piece of hardware on there that you could lash things to. All in all though, despite the failings of some of my uh, construction or the failings of my knowledge, I think I did actually a pretty good job of building it and it's still around. It's still, uh, it's leak free, it's rot free. And for the most part, except for the fact that it's getting a bit scuffed up and I certainly dropped the ball on keeping my varnish up to date. It's still a very viable boat, totally usable, used it this summer. And I will put a little bit of effort into trying to clean up the finishes here so that it goes on to uh, have a longer life. So it was a good learning experience. And this was the boat that caused me to transition from building boats as a hobby to wanting to do it full time. I enjoyed building this so much and I learned so much in the process that I went on to look for a boat building school to go to and apply to it. So this boat came along with me as I loaded up all my tools on my truck and drove out to the boat building school and move out to a new life building boats on the West Coast. All right, I've sanded down the entire boat inside and out. And on the inside, because I had this issue with my varnish, I've sanded it down with a fairly coarse paper, 150. That's not super coarse, but I wanted to really try and get the top layer of varnish uh, well, well flattened and hopefully lift off any troublesome stuff. And I noticed in these areas where it was kind of lifting from the grain that it still feels a little bit rough. And I think what I'm feeling here is the feather edges of that varnish or it's breaking away from the grain. And my goal is to try and flood some thin varnish down into these surfaces and try and get them to penetrate through to that exposed grain. To that end, I also want to get rid of any of those feather edges. I really want this varnish to soak in there and repair that, that open surface. And what I've found in the past is if you just try flooding a heavy layer of varnish over top, all you're going to see is all those little fine cracks just show right up through there. They're just going to penetrate right through that varnish. So we want to try and seal those up before we try and flood a film coat over top. That's why I want to use some ultra thin varnish to do that. But to make that work even better and to make try and get rid of any evidence that this was happening. Now I can't get rid of the staining that's happened. That's basically uh, fungal material that has gotten into the grain and changed the color of it. I can do nothing about that. But what I can do is I can just try and patch that, fill it, if you will. And so I'm going to use this steel brush to just try and go over these surfaces. And where a sandpaper could only touch what's on the surface, the steel brush will hopefully get down into those fine fissures and lift off any of that varnish that's not hanging on properly. Steel or brass brush is a great way to get into nooks and crannies that you couldn't get into with sandpaper as well. Just use a light touch. It'll do the same job for you. Now I'm using stainless steel brush so that there's going to be no particles of steel that remain behind and cause further damage or further staining. 
and I could use brass too, but I want to be a little bit more aggressive with this, which is why I'm using the steel. So I don't need to go over the whole boat, but I will go over these areas of concern and then we'll move on to the next step of the applying finishes to it. Okay, I've scrubbed out those areas and it really didn't take me very long, only about 10 minutes or something like that. Now I did spend a good solid four hours sanding this canoe inside and out. Now, the reason I'm doing this, laziness. The only alternative to what I'm doing right now is to strip the varnish out of this canoe right down to bare wood pretty much. And that is a huge job and I am not interested in putting in that kind of time and effort into this boat. This is my own boat. I wouldn't necessarily do this for a customer's boat unless the customer specifically said, let's try it. It's a cost saving measure. In this case, the cost is my time, but to a customer, the, my time is the cost as well. Now what I'm doing here is basically the bare minimum I can do while still being confident that I'm gonna get a good long lasting result. If I did any less, I am pretty positive I would regret it. Now I still may regret what I've done here. It may not fix the problem, but I think I have a fighting chance using this approach. Now, some of you might wonder why I don't just uh, put epoxy on there. Will that fix it? Well, epoxy is a great tool, but it is absolutely not a magic bullet. Used properly with the proper preparation, the proper foresight, and the proper uh, application of coatings afterwards that will protect epoxy from UV degradation, that would be a great solution. It'll give you a good long-lasting boat. But unless you are putting many, many coats of varnish on top of epoxy, it's just not going to last any longer. And I have not met a single person who tried to use epoxy to fix a varnish lifting problem that didn't regret that decision. Because more often than not, the problem is that they're not maintaining their boat with enough frequency. It doesn't matter how much epoxy you throw at it, if you're not putting protective coats on top of that on a very regular basis, it's just going to break down and the epoxy is going to be a bigger nightmare to get off than the varnish itself. So epoxy is a tool, not a solution to every problem. So I'm just going to go over this boat the once over again with my steel brush, just looking for any spots that I might have missed. And then I'm going to look at starting to put some coats onto here. Okay, I've got some varnish here and I've mixed it 50-50 with naphtha. The reason I'm using naphtha over spirits or paint thinner is because they're going to flash off faster. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scumble a bunch of varnish into these areas that need this attention. The idea is that the thin varnish will hopefully seep down into these fissures. And I could have thinned it more, but I would really like to make sure that it isn't just solvent going in there. We, we really want the, the resin that's in the varnish to work its way in there and act as a bonding agent. And we're just going to keep going over it and just agitating the surface here. Now, I'm not worried about surface finish because um, what I'm going to do is after I've let this sit for a minute. I'm going to come back. I'm going to work it in with a cloth and then I'm going to come back again with another cloth that just has some solvent on it to just wipe off the surface. So I'm just trying to get down into the cracks. I'm not trying to apply a film finish to the whole surface here. Now we're going to let this cure before we try and apply another coat over top. And the reason for that is that I want the fissures to seal up. If I were to apply another coat right away over top, my worry is that the next coat would draw some of this varnish back out of the fissures and allow them to open up again. Okay, I've left this sit around for a few minutes and now I'm just gonna take a cloth here and I'm just gonna start rubbing it in. Just going over these surfaces, trying to massage in all that varnish. I don't want it pooling anywhere. In fact, what I'm trying to make sure I do is I'm trying to make sure I'm breaking up any surface tension that might be preventing varnish from seeping down into those fissures. And now with the clean cloth, with just naphtha on it, I'm just going to gently wipe off that surface. 
because I only want this varnish in the cracks, remember. So we'll come back and we'll recoat the surface later on. So this is just a few minutes later. You can see our surface looks pretty much dry, even though I rubbed all that varnish on there. And that's because I wiped the varnish off the surface. So we'll leave this overnight and perhaps we'll do the same treatment again tomorrow and flood this out one more time before we do a top coat on the whole thing. Here's a technique people aren't familiar with. This is called padding on varnish. So I mean, I'm just using a thin varnish here for this, I, but I could be using it uh, full thickness. And it's, sometimes it's a good way to put varnish on just parts that are otherwise just a bit finicky to put on with a brush, like when you're doing the edges of things, for instance. So I'm just using a lint-free cloth a little varnish on there and this is the idea behind this is that varnish will flow out and level itself and the brush strokes don't really matter all that much what matters is that you just get an even coat on and you let chemistry and nature take care of the rest Of course, you save yourself the trouble of doing a brush cleanup. This uh, actually works quite well on things that have a lot of contours, like the rub rails on a canoe, for instance, which are notoriously difficult to try and get a, a brush to wrap around. And of course, it's not, not a really good technique for getting into nooks and crannies and tight crevices, but for uh, other applications, it works just fine. And of course your working surface is important. So I've just got triangular cleats here and I got a bit of packing tape on them so that nothing can stick to them. I've got one more part here. It's a little more complicated, but I'll pad it as well. I've just got another cloth with just a little bit of varnish on it that is uh, basically dried. It's acting like a tack cloth. It's just got sort of a, a whisper of varnish spread on it. And that's all a tack cloth really is, is, is a cloth with something sticky that will pick up that fine dust, but leave the surface dry in its wake. All right, so my uh, attempt at repairing this varnish, I think was middling successful. I think my, my concept of using thin varnish and rubbing it in worked okay, uh, but I did not do enough of it. I can still see there's maybe like half as much grain popping through as there was before. I gave it just one finished coat of varnish on top of that. So uh, in theory, it's a, it's a good fix, I suppose. In practice uh, requires more coats than I was able to give it. I really don't have the time to keep this boat in the workshop at the moment, but it's got a refreshing coat of varnish on it right now. So it's good to go for a bit. So I hope those little details were of interest to you. I hope this uh, helps you out. If you're a new builder, a, a hobby builder, and you're just getting started on your first boat, perhaps, or your second, or even your third, to think about some of the little details a little more carefully. The thing to remember is you don't have to make every boat perfect. Uh, you do what you can at the time that you're doing it. You try and push yourself a little further than you're comfortable with perhaps, but ultimately, so long as you got a learning experience out of it and you get a functional boat out of it, it's all good. It doesn't have to be uh, a precious jewel. It's perfectly fine to build something practical, slap a coat of paint on it and get out onto the water. Those are often my favorite boats anyway. I want to thank everybody on Patreon who helps support these videos. And if you could help me out on Patreon too, I really appreciate that. And you can find links in the corner or down in the description. So please join me again next time. And until then, have a safe and happy holiday. See you later, folks.